To begin our topic today, let's we talk about what techniques do students need to learn in intermediate stu study. At intermediate level, students are start to look for learning more technical and musical knowledge about performing cello. For technical study, on left hand, students need to learn the thumb positions, left hand pizzicato, shifting between different positions double stops, and more. On the right hand, students need to learn the right mix of bow techniques, which including the weight of the bow, the bow speed, contact point, hair angles, and tensions. So if we use the right mix of a bow techniques, it can be able to describe the right dynamics, the right style of the composition that we are playing. For musical knowledge, Students start to experience different music period compositions. Understanding the background history and performing in the right style, even though every student may sound slightly better in certain style, but has ability to play in all musical style are important for the study. And then let's we talk about why we choose woman compositions for intermediate study. The woman compositions is getting more popular in, prof in professional orchestra, university, college. Our, our research shows a lot of underrepresented uh, composition by female composers being performed twice more compared to five years ago. But for intermediate students, a lot of them did not see many compositions that is right for for the intermediate studies, which a lot many pieces, including the pieces I introduce you today, is have the great value for the student to study for the technical and musical study. Also, we need more diversities in the education style as well, which I will introduce you the three pieces wrote by women that was have the quality that met all the requirements I have mentioned before. The three pieces are Mary Carol Moore's Love Song, Agnes Zimmerman's Cello Sonata in G Minor, First Moment, Rebecca Clark, two pieces for violin, or viola, and cello. The first composer I'm gonna introduce you today is Mary Carol Moore. She was born in Memphis on 1873 by the family left Memphis within six weeks of her birth because of the yellow fever was expanded in the area. The whole family has moved to Indiana and then New Albany. Morris' younger brother died at the age of two because of brain fever. Morris' parents worried this gonna apply on her as well, so they did not allow more to study to how to read and do not want anyone to teach her how to read as well. But this doesn't apply for her music. Our moral show a lot of interest in music since she was our, a child. Her fam family hired a music teacher, Emma Duhost, who was an assistant to a well-known New York piano teacher. For her music training, Morrow was only allowed two 15 minutes partisan daily, including improvisation time. Her father also will take her to the local public music concerts as well for her music education. At age of eight, Morrow and her family moved to Napa Valley. She went to various school in the area and continued taking singing, piano, and music theory lesson with her uncle, who is our John, John Pratt, uh, who is Morrow's mother's youngest brother. Uh, he has studied in Leipzig several years on organ and music theory. Her parents want to send her to Europe to continue her study, but unfortunately, she damaged her voice when she was due to preparations, and her father lost his job, so she lost all the financial support for continued education. In 1889, 
Mora moved with her family to San Francisco and continued her voice and conversation study with her uncle, which she would travel in between San Francisco and Napa Valley during the weekend to take lessons. She had her first major work and her largest opera, Nasisa, are wrote it in 1908. She had three productions in 1912, 1925, and 1945. The unique part of this opera is Mara write the music part and Mara's mother write the lyrics and the, the speaking in between. The, they both show the synthetic portrayal to the Native Americans uh, for that time and redressing the growing shame of their treatment by the white settlers. In early 1920s, she moved to Los Angeles and joined the Federal Music Project. Her compositions are often performed with the Federal Music Project Orchestra. This project shut down by the World War II but after U.S. entered the World War II, there have been more famous composers from the rest of the countries come to Los Angeles, including Schoenberg, Stravinsky, and more like Rachmaninoff. Are so the this project have to be more international. Mora had to begin with our impressionism textures while she was in the, uh, in the project with the other composers. And this is affect her writing style uh, on her late compositions, which including this piece I'm gonna introduce to you today. The love song for cello and piano. She wrote it in 1945, which she considered one of her latest piece. Uh, Mm, and I'm very lucky to get this manuscript from University of Los Angeles Special Collections. And the handout you have been seeing is a transcriptions version of this manuscript. And if you see at your handout, uh, please look at your handout at page three from measure 36 to 46. She was using two different pentonic scales to show the French influence from it. The two pentonic scales, it sounds like. And and for the intermediate study, the students are starting to experience the thumb positions, which is widely used in this piece. Are. So the thumb positions is quite different than the students was used to play on the cello, which I will show you. will be more difficult for students. First, they are not used to play with their thumbs, and are, their thumb will not be as sensitive as other fingers on the strings to know that the, the intonation differences, and are, so this will bring the technical difference for the students. Are, for using the thumb positions in this pieces, are, let's we look at your page Down position was using on C, R, which is our sounds were placing on the harmonic on the D string. And the placing our sounds on the harmonic C helping us to move this passage more frequently, more, uh, more smoothly compared to the description here. So first I will show you the example. Thank you. 
been used is because it helped us to extend it to the next step. We are placing our drum position at the A flat. But if we do not play with the drum position, it will be hard to switch the notes to the E flat. We will, we will have to shift to the E flat and we will lost our intonation while we play here. So the drum position help our students to extend it, the notation and also have to give them more choice for the fingering when it's on the higher Now let me move on to our next composer. Which is Agnes Zimmerman. Agnes Zimmerman was born on July 5th, 1847 in Cologne, Germany. She came to England with her family when she was young with a recommendation by William Burnett she had admitted with Royal Academy of Music at age of nine. Zimmerman has studied the piano with Chiprani Porter and Ernst Porter. Her composition teacher are Charles Stegall and Sir George McFerry. Between 1860 and 1862, she was selected twice for the King's scholarships. While she started to have her professional career, she never discontinued her lessons. Zimmerman would travel uh, around to play in concert, but at the same time, she will, when she back to London, she will keep with her study. At age of 16, Zimmerman made her first public concert with two movements of Beethoven's Empire Concert at Crystal Place at, on December 5th, 1863. She also have been doing some international touring with her performing, including some Germany city like Hamburg and Leipzig. One German journalist, our boarding tribute have credits on Zimmerman's performance on Beethoven that they believe she had been followed the genius step, step by steps to be able to describe the right style of him. Zimmerman's composition style is taking influence from classical and early romantic composers, such as Beethoven, Mozart, and Schumann. Her early works are mostly in dance form, such as her piano, saraband, and jig for piano. Her most famous composition are the three sonatas for violin and piano. The first sonata for violin and piano in D minor was dedicated to and performed by Joseph Joachim, which was the leading violinist at that time. Her second and third sonata for violin and piano was both performed by Wilma Noruda, was also famous for Lady Halley, who was one of the leading female violinist of the day. Music Times have given a music review on her sonata. Please see your handout at page six. There is a clip from the music review that comments on her violin sonata that they believe is our laudable des desire to follow the highest model in ob observable in every moment. Zimmerman, also known as she edited the complete piano sonata of Mozart and Beethoven, and also complete all complete piano works by Schumann. Most of them are published by London Novalum Ever and Co. in late 19th century. Zimmerman's cello sonata in G minor, opus 17, was composed after her successful violin sonata. This sonata was published by the shot. The first movement of the cello sonata is in our standard sonata form. The ex exposition part has two contrasting things and connect with a very interesting passing sessions. While we play the second thing, 
we are performing the half nose triplet, which brings the questions to our students, what type of meter we need to follow. Uh, for example, look at your handout at page six, example one. In the very beginning, when we just learn the fourth position, once we play some passage, we will always want to cover that because they are very, very confident in that. Once they play it here, they always want to cover that. But for some passage, cover back and forth with the fifth position maybe is not a good idea. So please look at your uh, page seven. we move on to our last composer, our, which is Rebecca Clark. Rebecca Clark was born in Harrow near London in 1886. Her dad was a Boston and architect. Her mom is a, is a Germany and a daughter of a professor at University of Munich. 
Both of her parents loved chamber music. Clark learned the violin from the age of eight, and her dad will play cello, her mom will play the viola, and her other sibling will play violin as well. So they will have a family string quartet when she was young. Clark entered to the Royal Academy of Music at 1903. She studied the violin with Hans Wesley and harmony with Percy Miles. But her father moved her out of from the Royal Academy of Music uh, after two years of her study. It's because of her harmony teacher, Percy Miles, proposed to her. So she had to drop the school but well, the time that sh she studied in the Royal Academy of Music, she was earned the bronze and silver medals. She co was continued her composition and violin practicing after she left the Royal Academy of Music. And in 1907, she became the only female student of Charles Stanford at Royal College of Music during the period of 1908 to 1910. Stanford not only shaped her development on composition, but also struck her to switch from violin to viola, which she was most famous for later. Uh, through the instruction and performance of opportunities, Rebecca Clark had rapidly developed new skills and her confidence was growing. But at 1910, she was thrown out of the house by her fathers. She lost all her financial support with only 12 pounds on her. The reason is because she found her father's mistress letter while her father was travel aboard. Rebecca Clark made a tower mixed by ash trays, paperweight, and vase, and placing the pocket of letters on the top to show him that she knows about his affair and and com and condemned his affair. Upon to find the towers, he, her dad explode and angry told her, "Leave the house and don't let me see you anymore." And Rebecca Clark became a professional violin player and also an independent lady to support herself back to the early 20th century. In 1912, she became one of the first women to be employed by Henry. Ward first, the Queen's Hall Orchestra. In 1916, she began a U.S. residency. She has played with Charles May McCool uh, extensively in Hawaii uh, between 1918 to 1919, and also on a round world tour of British colonies in 1923, which also including Asian countries like China, Japan, Guava. We should see a handout at page seven. There is a newspaper has reported this phenomenal trip that sh they have been went. They also including some pictures of the Asian country that you can see some of the Buddhist tower and also have the forbidden cities or stone boat, that part of it. And during those years, Rebecca Clark achieved films as a composer with, as well. Her most famous are Viola Sonata, her piano trio, and also are her rapacy for cello and piano are, was composed in 1923 and was so, sponsored by the American Portrait Elizabeth College. Our, Rebecca Clark settled in London in 1924 where she performed as a soloist and also ensemble player. She also played with a lot of female cellists at that time, like Kahalia Sagar and May McCall. Uh, she also formed the all-female players English ensembles, which is a piano quartet, has Rebecca Clark, Major Howard, Kathleen Lam, and May McCall. Clark also played as a soloist and ensemble musicians in BBC broadcasting or, and made several recordings. After her, her marriage with James Fransky in 1944, she stopped performing and composing. Or, Rebecca Clark sold her viola 
and is published to the Mei Merkel's Prize at Royal Academy. This prize is still awarded annually to an outstanding cellist. Uh, this piece I'm going to introduce you today is the two pieces for viola or violin and cello by uh, 1918. So before we're going to uh, show you this piece, uh, place your handout at page eight. There is a program that shows Rebecca Clark was work as a chamber musician in America uh, during the World War I and giving the recital on February 13, 1918 in New York City. She was programmed the, her, her lullaby and grotesque for the viola and cello. An interesting fact about this program are, as you see, the Morpheus, the Morpheus was named by Anthony Schrett. And actually this piece was composed by her. And the reason that she did not put her name with this pieces is because she was feel uncomfortable to uh, self-promote herself in the United States. But at the same time, she was mentioned two pieces that write by her showing in the same program that are uh, and she do not want to show the criticism that she have been so eager to bring attentions for her own compositions. Uh, these two pieces, which in are very two contrasting things, lullaby and grotesque. The lullaby is a, is a sleeping uh, sound that the mom usually sing to the babies for the baby to go to sleep. And the grotesque, which means it's gross, it's weird, yeah, it's a very contracting thing. So to be able to perform those two contrasting pieces, uh, the student need to thinking about what type of the bow techniques that we need for the two different type of style to show the style more, uh, more obviously. So for the students uh, to for playing those kind of things, 
speaking about their thinking because they want to avoid the same thinking of those, those parents, those drugs, mm -hmm. they know. And also, we can know so much sound more matching the, the sound they can use to make. If we are struck with the sleepy drum, we say, mm -hmm. very beginning of the group chat, the left hand kick drum was only hit the notes by uh, the open string while uh, not playing the lines on the top part. The reason they are using the left hand kick guitar is because you are not having enough time to use our right hand kick shape this much. <laughs> These are the three pieces that are all writing by the female composers have provided very wonderful music and covered many techniques for intermediate students to learn. I hope you also enjoy their personal historical story and please enjoy the second half of the recital, which I will be performing all three pieces I have to show you before. Thank you.